Welcome to Gutterman. This is Will Sanchez. My very special guest tonight is Benigno Veras. He runs for the Van Cortlandt Track Club. I met Benny a few years ago when he was a crew member on my Save the Putnam Trail documentary. Benny is very much behind the scenes player. He also connected me to the Van Cortlandt Track management team together we were able to support the charity, Children of Fallen Patriots, in doing the relay 500 for the Fallen. I'm thrilled to have Benny as a guest. Thank you. Benny, let's get started by introducing yourself to our audience. For example, tell us about where you were born, a little bit about your childhood. I was born in the Dominican Republic and lived there my first 15 years. I came to the United States in 1970. But all this memory just draw me back there to the other children, my peers, and I always remember them and my heart and long that one day maybe I will run into one of them. Uh, it hasn't quite happened yet. Did you guys play sports in the Dominican Republic? You guys are known for baseball. Yes, baseball was the, or is the big pastime in the Dominican Republic. Um, as kids, we were very poor, very poor parents, but we managed to uh, get a hold of rubber ball and play baseball in the streets. Um, we didn't use equipment. Maybe the rich kid had a glow, but we had to, um, the way we started playing was by punching the ball with the fist. We would hold the ball in one hand mm -hmm. and make a fist and some people toss the ball in the air and then you punch it as hard as you could or you just punch it right from your hand. And we had our own style of doing this. Um, they knew your ability by how you um, punched the, punch the ball, right, right. Did you have nine people to a, to a club, to a team? We had actually four to a team. One first, one second, and then one behind in the middle of the street, and then another fellow way back um, as a, the outfielder. We didn't have anybody at the home plate. At the home plate, you would stand at the home plate and then you punch the ball. Okay. And before you start running. Okay, so what the idea was to catch the ball and um, how you were tagged out? or how No, you throw out like you throw the runner out, just okay. like you do in baseball. Okay. But we, we didn't have a diamond. This was more like a, like a rectangular field. You know, the three are long uh -huh. rectangle. Okay. Well, did you have a nickname as a baseball player? Did they call you Slugger or did... Uh... No, we call each other by, by our own name, no, our nickname that we gave it to each other. But we like to wear a shirt with the number of our favorite player in the major leagues. And what was the major big players at that time? Well, back then, I remember Julian Javier, he used to play second baseman for the St. Louis Cardinals. Um, but I also remember Manuel Mota with, I think he played with Los Angeles. He was uh, one of the greatest pinch hitters. In pinch baseball. hitters, yes. oh, Manuel Mota. Manuel Mota, Manny Mota, they call it here. Manny Mota. And there was Rico Cari, who played with Atlanta. Rico, oh, he was a great hitter, He right? once was um, um, one of the, the, um, the batting, Title. Oh. I think in 68 or 69, I don't remember exactly. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's like in the 340s or 350s, very yes. high up. Yes, yes. And then, of course, you had the Alou's brother, if you remember the that. The Alou brother. Yeah, we call him Alou. Like Alou, the, not like, Alou. Like the telephone. Alou, Alou. <laughs> and at one time, they all play the outfield for, I think, for the San Francisco Giants. I think you're right. They did one time. I think all two of them played with the Mets. Well, they got traded eventually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But at one time, they had all three outfield brothers. Matty Alo was the more prolific hitter. He played center fielder, and they have Felipe Alo playing left fielder. He became manager of Montreal eventually. Montreal, Felipe. I think he played for the Yankees. He too. also played for a year or two with the Yankees, and then he went oh, into manager. Because, so your your country has a rich history of sports. And then after that, I moved to the United States, and then we got a new breed of runners, or oh, players. Players who. Because now all these major leaguers are putting camps there, trying to recruit. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a big, uh, 
the minor leagues probably they have a minor league association. Yes, yeah, they, they, they I think they have a class A and class well, double A. I don't remember. Dominican Republic for a country that size probably generates more baseball players than any place else. I, exactly, and it's a major source of income there and something to be proud of for Dominican. Oh yeah, I'm sure. Uh, but you said you made it to the States when you were 15. Yes, I on my actually I arrived here on my the day before my 15th birthday. birthday. Yeah. Were you by yourself, or were you trying to escape the poverty? How was, is there a story to that? Well, yeah, of course. We of all course. Tried to Let's hear it. Try to escape poverty. Yeah, uh, my mother came here first, in soon after the revolution of 1965. She had a relative who promised her mother that she would get her a visa to come to the United States. So she left my half brother and I with an aunt for about four or five years until she got a visa for us. So we waited our turn, and she also waited her turn. Uh -huh. and, and like they say here, you gotta wait your turn. Gotta wait your turn. Right. And my brother and I came in 1970, and, and all of that, I really miss everything that I left behind, yes. uh, playing baseball. Baseball. Uh, playing ball with the, the, with the hand fist. public is only uh, one, air, one flight away. It's very easy to get to, right? Well, back then, it was just one airport, uh, maybe one or two airlines okay. would travel between Dominican Republic and New York. And in those days, you didn't have the money, of course, to, to do that kind of traveling. Yeah, uh, so my mother is working here um, as a seamstress in the 1960s. And those jobs soon began to disappear, as you know. Well, they the, disappeared in the 80s or 90s. B b by the 80s, they were all gone. And so she used to work with a this machine and yeah yeah a factory in a factory right right and then eventually she worked from home she had a, an industrial machine and he she would do the, the job they would bring it to her or the yep. or the cut fabric for her to then put it together yeah yeah that's a very valuable skill if you know how you were seamstress you always had work to do that eventually died out by the 90s it was all gone yeah yeah it, it was the good thing uh, yeah. it was not profitable to have but that. eventually you, you you got to go to school here right well, so tell us what my, school did my you go to? brother and i went straight to school so you got uh, soon you know the next day we arrived here and and now i can appreciate that because i eventually became a teacher and i know what immigrants coming to the United States go through. So you learned English over here? Yes, in high school. So where, where, where did you go to school? I went to George Washington High School, a few blocks from my, uh, in my neighborhood, a few blocks from my, my home. George Washington is where, in Manhattan? George Washington is in um, Fort George. What, George? Yes, at 192nd Street oh, okay. and the other one. The, there's an area that they call Fort George because uh, that was one of those um, Ford that George Washington uh, had. Oh, so you were born yeah, in it, it historical. You, yeah, it gives you this view of the of the Harlem River. And the other fort in the neighborhood was on. Um, it had had a look toward the Hudson River, and that was the or still is the um, Fort Tryon, Fort Tryon Park. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went to City College. And uh, what did you study there? I went to study music. Music? Yeah. Um, you said you were a teacher. Did, were you planning to be a teacher at that time? No. Uh, actually, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. When I was in high school, I ended up playing the violin. Did you still play? Um, not quite. Okay. I didn't quite made it to, uh, to Carnegie Hall, like they say. Okay. I mean, you got to practice a lot to make it to Carnegie Hall. Yeah, yeah. You know the joke. Okay. Were you actively engaged, you know, running, any kind of sports? No. That was the farthest thing in my mind because all of, I wanted to be a baseball player. And when I went to high school, I didn't know that there was even a team there. They had a team there. And, but it, it never occurred to me to find out or ask, you know, can I join the, the baseball team? Yeah. So I just picked up a violin because I saw somebody. Actually, I saw a substitute teacher playing the violin um, my first year. And the next year, I told the counselor, hey, I want to play, I want to take music. Okay. Well, while you were in college, did you play baseball then? No, no, no. What happened? No, Why? No. Did it, no sports in college? Uh, I, no. I, Why? I, it didn't even occur to me. I stuck to my music. And that's what I did. I eventually got my degree in music. And then I went back to George Washington High School uh, some seven years later. And the principal was still there, that same principal. 
and he hired me on the spot. He said, oh, I need a school aid. And I remember that you used to play the violin here. Excellent. So, so he you, hired me and... So you were a teacher at... Uh, not yet. From there, that put me in a path to a... Oh, a, a okay. path to, to be a teacher. Oh, okay. You had to go back to get, uh, to yeah, get to, training, to get yeah, a exactly. degree in teaching. Well, I have most of my teachers there, still there. Okay. So I began training on the job, as oh, they call it. That's the best way to learn, yeah, right, I guess. Right. And George, this is George Washington. This is at George Washington School. Now, and, and back then, was it a, I don't know, was it a tough school, or the tough kids, or well, the, what was the reputation? The, the, the worst was over. The worst was happening while I was entering the school in the late 60s. The and, worst? Yes, because there were riots. There were problems with the parents. There were problems with the unions, teachers and parents going at each other. Oh, my goodness. There were days when they would surround the school with police, and I didn't understand what was going on. Well, you got quite an education besides uh, book learning, besides it, music. You it, got an like, education right. and, uh, uh, a social commit, a social activism. I, exactly. That was a big lesson for me there. Okay. But you're a well-known runner now. In fact, you're a much beloved runner for the Grand Cortland Track Club. So something must have sparked your interest in running. Was it baseball? Well, tell us the story. Sure. I ended my career in a way uh, that I'm not too happy. Uh, trying to go back now. To teaching? To teaching, yeah. I'm a substitute now. I used to be a full-time teacher. Before. Okay. So um, after I stopped working, I became very depressed. And I had to find depression for many, many years. And I seek help. And treatment and and nothing seemed to improve the situation for me. I'm without a job, you know, I'm not able to go back to hold a job because of my depression and my anxiety. I suffer from anxiety. So some five years ago I say goodbye to the med he said, and I told myself because I couldn't stand you know, the side effect on medication. So I told my um, um, my doctors, my, my therapist, that I wasn't going to take anymore, that I was going to take on running. And the way that happened is uh, one day I was so afraid I was going to die. It just came to my mind, if you don't get up at 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the morning and go and run, you're just going to die there in bed. And I frightened myself so much. I got up every day at 5 o'clock and went and ran 5, 7 miles. Where did you run? My neighborhood. Which at, was in the Bronx? In, or no, in, no, in Washington Heights. Oh, Washington Heights. Around my school, my alma mater, okay. uh, George Washington High School. I would run this loop of about, about a mile, and run three or five loops, about five, seven miles. And then I went for my daily uh, activity, you know, going to therapy or, or volunteering or doing something. But that's how I started running. Now, one day I signed up, New York Road Runner, and I'm doing this 60K. I had no idea what it was. The Knickerbocker. Yeah, the, that was the name, the Knickerbocker. I was upset because I couldn't get into the marathon. I didn't know what it takes to get into the New York City Marathon. So they had this Knickerbocker two weeks later, so That's I signed up. It's easy to get in. He said, oh, 60K better than 26 miles. <laughs> yeah. More back for your money. Yeah, exactly. So I said, oh, so let me go and do it. So I'm running here. I'm running to Susan Epstein. He said, Benny, what are you doing? I didn't know you were a runner. And she and her husband, uh, Arnie Gore, introduced me to this club, the Van Van Track Portland club. Track Club, in December 2010. I remember that day. So that's when I joined the club, and it became a different world. It but they're in the Bronx, so are they easy to get to for you? Oh, yeah. Uh, um, I'm in Washington Heights, and just either take the soap with the number one train to the last stop, or just run another 5K to them. Okay, That's how far it is. The 5K from, from your my, house to... From my uh, address to Van Cotland Park. To Van Cotland Park. It's not a big thing. So that was a new life. It is a new life. It's a new network for me and really have improved my quality of life. Oh. I mean, really, really made all the difference because now I'm employed again. I'm not on demand. I, yes, I see my therapy once in a while. But running is like a, the right medicine. Excellent, excellent. And, and so, so now you're running for the Van Cortland Track Club. You have a, your first race was an ultra at the 60K. Actually, well, that's all my second race. My first race was the, uh, what do they call it? The, uh, this race before the marathon, I forgot the name. It's a four-miler. But then I couldn't get into the marathon. That, that okay, had me very upset. 
You think, so I you think, oh, but here's a, why people don't run this. This is bad. <laughs> <laughs> and you just going like a hundred times around Central yeah, Park. I, I know, it's like that's, nine mm, times around, yeah. It's that's a lot. The most boring race. You really had to have the right, the right mindset for this. And, and you felt very, very good about doing it. Uh, oh, yes. Especially when I finished. Okay. So now you're with Van Cortland Track Club, and you probably still want to run New York City because did you eventually do New York City? Well, eventually, yes. Last year was my first marathon. First marathon? Yes. I've done all these races, even ultras, but not a marathon. Ah, interesting. So it's difficult to get into New York City, but it's very expensive. Ah, uh, yes, it is. You can go anywhere in the world and run the marathon. And, you know, with the money that you, you know, uh, and have money left for, for traveling and, and, and expenses. <laughs> it, it's gotten very expensive, especially the last three years, or four yeah, years maybe. $226. Not I everybody know. can afford that. Okay. But somehow you managed that. I guess it was your once in a lifetime. Well, the club helped me. Okay. <laughs> and now I'm able to uh, afford it. You know, uh, Excellent. It's, Excellent. You know, the other races, you know. Okay. Uh, so uh, before you did the marathon, you were just doing local races? Local races, yes. And also um, local, like in the other area outside New York City, I will travel with other members of the club. You know, like the where? What was your, some of your favorite out, uh, of, the, out of the, the area? The, another club in Westchester, the Taconic Roadrunner. Taconic? Yeah, they also put up a lot of races and, and places like upstate New York. I remember, I think the last two years, because I saw the pictures, it's something called the North Face Endurance. Oh, that's, yeah, that's, a, that's another crazy thing that I got into, uh, thanks to Kevin Shelton Smith, uh, who, you know, he invited me that and, and back in 2011. And we get up early on May, in the first weekend in May, and do a, we first we did a 50K, and then we, and we went for the 50 miler. The, the following year? Every year we went. Every back. after that. Uh, uh, he's amazing, he, the way he finished that. I failed the first three times. I just couldn't complete it. I time out. Oh, there's a time limit. Oh, yes. Now, where was it? Where was it held? This is in Bear Mountain Park. Oh, that's a beautiful area. Yes. But it is one of the toughest courses that you can run. It's not just, this is not just about speed, but it's about overcoming obstacles and, 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 and hills and, and down trees on your way and mud. And, okay, and, but instead of getting frustrated, you said, I'm coming back oh, next year. I, I, and do we, went, we went back every year, and, and finally this year I was able, and, you know, like four years, five years later, I was able to, uh, to complete it without timing out. In 2011, I did it 50K, and then in every year I failed to complete the 50 mile Miler. until this year. This year, 2015. This past May. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. That's a <laughs> very dedicated to to be able to go back and try and try again. Uh, right, yeah, now I don't feel like I have to go and prove anything again. But, <laughs> um, but there are the races, there are the ultras there. Okay, and last year, November, you did the first New York City, your first New York City. Uh, and the only marathon I ever done, right. Okay, right. so you might do New York again, or? Oh, I'm already signed up this time. Oh, yeah. right. Uh, and, and all right. Yeah, and so I need to um, improve what okay. I did before. Yeah. All right, but let's talk a little bit about nature. Because I mentioned at the beginning of the show that I met you through the Putnam Trail. I was going to go out and do a filming on it. And you were introduced to me as somebody that could, A, could help so scout the area, which you did help us. And you also worked behind the scenes holding whatever needed to be held to help the producers. And you were, it was obvious to all of us, you were very passionate about not only the Putnam Trail, but a lot of nature. Where did that come from? Where did that love of, uh, of nature come from? Because honestly, not everybody has that. Well, I had an affinity for nature since I was a child. I just didn't pay attention to it. I couldn't appreciate it as I do now. After a whole life, you see what's going on around you, then you begin to appreciate it. So when I heard from, uh, you, I think you know the name Mark, Michael Armstein, and I signed up into the, um, the petition uh, to save the Pond and Trail. And then I met Susan Cover, and I began to learn what this is all about. And, and I saw an opportunity here to do something for 
not just the environment, but nature as a whole. And that you don't have to go to other places in the world to, to do your part. This was right in your backyard. Yeah, this is right in front of, you know, in, in back here in your front yard. And so uh, you can say that I'm really in love with that, um, Van Cortland Park because it has this unique ecosystem. And I really, really want to help protect it. In fact, you spoke very eloquently at the Department of Environment Conservation hearing. I would like you to tell the DEC that by law, they're in charge of protecting the environment, specifically the wetlands. And that there is a entity that everybody forgetting about it. That is called the Tibet Brook. If you look in the map, you will see the Tibet going through Van Cortland. But if you go and pay a visit, you won't find it because it's, it, it's not there. You, if you visit to the park looking for the Tibet Brook, nobody will be able to point it out to you. It, it is not there. It, it, these people from the railroad company a long time ago, they bury it on the ground. So you cannot see it. Uh, I invite you to Van Corton Park and, and look for yourself what, what, what actually happened to the Tibet Ribbit. I think it's so shameful. And, 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 and forget about all this proposal, all this uh, improvement. I think nature should be allowed to heal. It doesn't need any help from us. Just let it heal, please. Tell us about the Tibets. Well, there is no such a thing as Tibet anymore. It just wastes water that came from the coverts and, and the runoff from the stormwater. And you look on the map, it looks like there's a Tibet there, but there isn't a Tibet there. And water is left going into the sewer. And that's crazy, a river going into the sewer. But I think they call it daylighting. They're going to return it. And that's what I'm hoping for, that maybe in my lifetime they'll begin doing that at some point. Some saying that this is an abandoned, what do they call it, abandoned? Right away. Right. Or abandoned. Railroad. It used to railroad. be an old railroad. But, and I said, well, that's cool. Let's completely abandon the thing. Because actually, you cannot have a trail on, on a wetland. It's wet, right? Yep, yep. You cannot, you cannot make a trail. We have a trail because this is the, the, the uh, railroad bed, the, the, the blast, what right, do you call right, it? Right, right, right. It's right underneath. That's right, that's right. And we just put some soil there, the park so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Soil so that we can walk, which is lovely. I'm not saying that we shouldn't have it, but, but the thing is that this is wetland and it should be allowed to be wetland so that maybe we can then daylight the tibet and maybe that water can be clean and instead of putting it in the sewer, we can send it back. Okay. But those are two different things, yeah. daylighting the tibets and the Putnam Trail. Oh yes, absolutely. Okay. And, uh, and also we should walk along the Tibet, or run along the Tibet. You know, the, the, because this is a rail road, it goes straight. Mm -hmm. And at some point, it runs over where you, the Tibet used to run. Uh -huh. and, I, and also, they are um, something they call, and I didn't know this, I just learned this by joining this group. People think that this is uh, something that needs fixing. Uh, I disagree. Oh, OK. Anyway, I go there many times, and I take my consumer video recorder and I break my back because you had to put this you had to bend down and put the camera right ugly right on the ground on the mud mm -hmm. and I start recording these things and I don't know if people can appreciate this but I do you can see all kinds of insects yes I see some of your videos and you're very artistic because sometimes it's a close-up of something that looks like garbage and then you pad back I, and it's teeming with life. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, I'm limited on my equipment. This is a consumer lens. I cannot, but I. But you can still do beautiful yeah, things. Yeah, exactly. I, all I want to do is just show this to people, okay, that, that you just can go and cover this with, uh, with soil so that people can roll their bike or walk or run. I don't agree with that. Okay. I think we should let this thing come back. And if we need to go to the Pond and Trail, we should walk around it. Okay. And, and what are some of your challenges 
physical challenges did you have for yourself? Is there a destination race? Is there I know you want to do New York City Marathon again. Is there a, uh, besides the North Face, is there an ultra you, on the horizon for you? Well, uh, maybe this is my ego, my part, because I started running when I was 55 years ago, five years ago. So I, don't, I feel like I don't have a running record yet. I'm still a young runner. Okay, so young runner, yes. Yeah. Some of these people in Van Cortland Track Club, they've been running since they were in high school. They have a long history of running. So I want to run as much as um, my body allows me and, and as fast as I, my body allows me. And, and I tell some people, I want to die on my feet. So well, hopefully that's many, many, many years from now. Yeah. Uh, so your goal is to run as far and as often as you can. Exactly, because this is what has given me like a second life. Um, your second life because yeah. you were mentally depressed. Oh, and I'm still, anxiety. I'm still battling that. And, uh, and running yeah. helps you on that. And then, and then finally, you said one of your goals, you're now a substitute teacher, you want to go back to full-time teaching or? I may want to do that and then retire because I put a number of years and I want to complete that. You want to do 20 years off or whatever it is? Uh, maybe another five or 10. I mean, you want to complete a total. Is yeah. that pension related or anything like that? Well, it will help. It will help, all right. Because my pension is not complete. Okay, well, listen, good luck on that. Thank you. And thank you for coming in. Thank you. The pleasure.